all here tonight to our lecture. My name is Tom Cordero, and I'm a campus minister at the Catholic Student Center. And it's my privilege and honor to introduce our speaker tonight. In our lifetime, the word prophet has taken on new meanings uh, to many of us. No longer do we see prophets as merely Old Testament soothsayers, but we see them as people who stand up and speak against the evil in society. They are men and women who have the courage to take unpopular stances and even risking injury because they feel compelled by God to speak out. And today we have with us a modern day prophet of this kind, a man who belongs to a community who call themselves the Companions of Jesus. And I'd like, I, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Father Dan Berrigan. Well, thank you. At least the introduction is some evidence of rehabilitation. So I'll take that back east with me. Well, the subject of tonight I was reflecting today is one that one finds very difficult for many reasons, one of them being um, the idea that there should ever be the need in, in a civilized scheme of things to speak about such prisons as concern us, whether it's the American prison scene in general or whether it's more in a more refined and uh, torturing way, the conditions at Marion, which in many ways sum up the whole scene. It's terrible to have to give one's life to what could be called only distractions to real life. But there are those distractions like war and, and uh, nukes and uh, prisons and ghettos and draft file centers and all those things that keep us from building what might be called a sane society. And here they are and here are we. And we must, it seems to me, um, confront these realities because they are matters for very many, as we know, of life and death. Well, uh, I'm not sure. I would like to concentrate in my part of the evening on a very brief history and uh, the ethos of the prison scene as concentrated in Marion, Illinois. You probably are aware that in the last 30 or so years, the whole kind of psychiatrizing of experience has resulted in a massive, even though subtle, shift in the understanding of crime and of punishment. For a long time in our history, perhaps throughout the whole 19th century at least, we had this notion of crime as sin, crime as offense, to which offense was due punishment or revenge, juridically or socially applied, at least according to the jargon, and then all of a sudden, it seemed to me in my own lifetime, there was this massive shift in understanding and we began to be invaded by a whole infestation of uh, shrinks and shrinkifiers. And this resulted in, practically speaking, I think, societally speaking, a new definition of what it was to deviate or to commit crime or to be on the outside, the outside edge. And now we were supposed to look upon crime as illness. And into this kind of new void, uh, which was at the same time a vortex of obscurity, since nobody seemed to know anything about these things except the witch doctors, there rushed the whole core of these cure artists, who were at the same time, of course, functioning very strongly and with the powerful re remuneration in the society at large. And then they set their sights from the campus and from the great cities on the prison scene. And we have a whole transformation of the understanding, as I say, of this um, structure, this structure of deviance. 
and now crime is no more than illness and can be dealt with on that basis. That is to say, we are not now exacting revenge, and again I'm referring to the jargon, we are now healing or curing or restoring or rehabilitating. There were events in the 60s that of course hastened the whole thing brutally. And one could point to things as diverse as the uh, bloody uprising and uh, retaking of the state facility at Attica in New York State. Uh, one could point, I think, to the social backlash which attended so strongly on the, uh, the social upheaval of the war. Uh, the breaking down of traditional boundaries of officially declared law and order, the whole awakening to the limits of the law, which came up, let's say, in the South and North eventually in the Civil Rights Movement. All of these things made the prison scene more electric and dangerous and capable of invasion by new ideas which were, of course, very much at large in the society itself. Well, the part that academe had in all this, of course, was very marked, even though academe is very slow to admit any kind of complicity. What has occurred throughout the nation in the larger prison facilities would have been, practically speaking, impossible without the complicity of academics. I think this can be verified at practically every point. The ideas came from the pure and social sciences and the psychologists, which were eventually transferred and um, structured in the prisons. Well, I want to refer tonight especially to one um, pattern that emerged in all this, uh, especially in this kind of interlocking interest between the university and the prison system. I don't have really any answer tonight as to why this should have occurred or why the academics and the intellectuals should not have exercised the mitigating effect on the savagery of the prison system instead of reinforcing it. I think this is a, a vexing, continuing question for all of us who were brought up or who were students uh, operating under the belief that a certain kind of superior morality or understanding was operating uh, in the academic world. But this was part of a larger breakdown in which the complicity of the university extended also, as we know, in so many cases, to the worst elements of public occurrence, whether it was war and war research or whether it was the prisons. So we're speaking about a rhetoric that is no longer supported by the facts. In any case, uh, there was one very important meeting in the early 60s between a group of uh, behavior modification experts at MIT and the head of the prison system, federal prison system. And the first proposal, as far as we could find, was made at that meeting about uh, applied brainwashing, for which they had discovered the uh, elegant abstraction behavior modification. <clears throat> the idea was to take care of deviants, especially the explosive situation of those from the minority groups, especially, who were becoming troublesome either because they had been in the streets for social change or awakened to that need in the prisons. They were the real target of the so-called troublemaking element that needed a new type of prison. I remember very clearly because I was in prison at the time of the Attica uprising and uh, remember the atrocious fallout and vengefulness and spontaneous cries that arose for a kind of super prison, since even the so-called so uh, um, close security places were evidently no longer working very well. 
And Attica, which was kind of the bottom line in that system, had exploded. So there was a cry for an entirely new direction at that time. Well, in any case, uh, if, if healing was required for some kind of intellectual illness or emotional deviance, then the psychiatrists and the social scientists were going to be increasingly important to the whole thing. And at this meeting, a man named Schein, a doctor in psychology from MIT, arrived in Washington with a long series of practicalities which were very enthusiastically received by the prison authorities. And they amounted, to, of course, to it seems to me to a convergence of a lot of knowledge that had been gathering unattended, both from the American public scene and from the so-called Iron Curtain or communist countries. Remember, as early as the Korean War, we were talking about the effect of brainwashing on captured soldiers and others. Well, now the theory was dusted off and cleaned up, sanitized, as far as its language was concerned, and applied to prisoners, which was a kind of new thing. Though the idea of experimenting socially on prisoners in America was a very old thing. Could I just say in this regard, there's an ironic footnote to the Nuremberg trials. A whole group of German doctors, as you recall, had been accused of war crimes because of experiments upon the aged and the handicapped and the Jews. And their defense was of great interest to our topic tonight because they declared after a study that the Americans had no right to try them for crimes we had been guilty of domestically for at least 200 years. And they were able to trace this uh, abusive and degrading thread of our history throughout the prisons. Well, now, of course, we have something far more sinister because we are not leaving scars or marks upon bodies. We are working over minds, whether with drugs, electric shock, surgery, isolation, so on. I'd like to just read and comment a few of the, of the recommendations of that evening, uh, of that meeting, excuse me, that were later applied at Marion, Illinois and which are now available throughout the federal and the state systems because the danger of this and the actuality has proliferated. Well, here is what Shine proposed, and this is only a very small part. I took the most interesting of them since we have only one evening. Quote, physical removal of prisoners to areas isolated sufficiently to break or seriously weaken their close emotional ties. So in that regard, the older uh, supposition, let's say the pre-psychiatric supposition had always been that rehabilitation depended upon keeping those ties intact. And even, at least in the language of penology, striving to strengthen them during the time. So that in the early, at least the early understanding of certain prisons, uh, the location near the urban centers where the prisoners had come from was very important. But now there was being kind of canonized this business of isolation and remoteness and making it deliberately difficult in many ways for families to stay together while one member is incarcerated. And that as specifically now as a measure designed to keep people off balance emotionally, to keep them lonely you see, uh, to have grow upon them the uh, horrific sense that they are alone in the world and that all the former ties, whether of biology or spirit, whatever you want to call them, of love, are broken or at least are seriously weakened. And we don't have to, I think, uh, uh, expend great effort tonight in realizing the, the suffering that this involves, not merely on the part of the prisoner, but on the part of the family itself and the friends, lovers, all. So what was formerly in the, in the old conception of, of uh, crime as um, punishable offense or sin in a kind of an old theological back, uh, uh, framework 
is now radically altered, and what was looked upon as a fault in the system has now become a virtue. That's, a, that's an astonishing turnaround, you see. Well, let's take another one of these. Um, our friend Dr. Schein uh, further recommended the segregation of all natural leaders within the prison. This, again, it has an interesting history, as Andali realized. Uh, one of the main historical methods of uh, <laughs> retribution had always been a certain segregation. Prison implies that itself. We are segregating people by placing them in prison. But even within the prison, of course, there are circles of hell. And so segregation continues within the, within the compound within the so-called population. And again, what was formerly looked upon or being begun to look upon, be looked upon as a, as a fault in the system, that is that people should be without their natural ties, is now becoming a virtue to be striven for within the prison. So they are not merely to be segregated from the outside world and former life and love and family ties they are now, especially if they exhibit anything like natural or cultivated leadership within the prison, they are to be separated. So segregation becomes a tactic, a positive tactic of so-called healing. I leave it to you to try to put that together. I have never really known a human being who could survive in America alone. <laughs> uh, and we don't have to restrict the case to prisons, I would think. And yet, if I may be pardoned, a reflection on the culture as a whole, it seems to me a very natural kind of outgrowth of so many of the, of the dark spiritual drives that are, that are at work in the culture, in the society itself. That is to say, the very competitiveness of life at large segregates us one from another and makes it inevitable that there be victim and victimizer in the land. So I, I always like to reflect, even though it's very bitter and unpleasant to, to do so, that what Shine was reflecting on and recommending for the prisons were actually the forces at large in the society now concentrated, you know, almost like a diffused beam brought to bear upon an individual soul. But we can't see Shine or his cohorts as operating in a kind of vacuum, you know. And I find it again just just perhaps to narrow the, the, the wide cultural understanding or effort to understand to the university that that by and large our young people are encouraged to segregate, to clot to declare areas of winning and losing very early in the intellectual career or the professional preparation. So it's really, I, I think what I, what I have uh, come to realize was that Shine had the kind of demonic courage to begin to apply to a kind of laboratory situation those things which are always infesting the air in our midst in our midst, a system that any large understanding of would require us to say demands, demands, winners and losers, not merely in prison, but in life, in life. And that that same kind of breakdown of natural affinity will be occurring in all sorts of areas of which the prisons will be one instance. Well, anyway. He would like to have natural leadership segregated within the prisons. And that, of course, is uh, demands, you know, the, the kind of lockup that we are familiar with that the article that you were given speaks of at Marion. And eventually, when it's led to its kind of cruel, ultimate impasse, leads to the boxcar cells. They're the ultimate shoebox for the human being and the ultimate triumph of the principle of segregation, which I submit is, is at work at large. Well, he goes on to say, there's spying on prisoners and reporting back private material. 
spying on prisoners. Well, could anyone have lived through the 60s and not see that that was a general kind of dictate of uh, the lives and, and activities of our authorities? We were all spied on. Shine didn't create bugs or surveillance. He merely, again, is taking a, a kind of cultural idiocy, uh, a tactic of practically everybody in the top echelons of every uh, section of government, and now uh, concentrating it again so that the prisoner will never have a corner in which to be private, in which to have a private thought or a private gesture or a word that will be heard by only by the one for whom it is intended. Well, the divisive aspects of all that don't need to be enumerated, don't need, need to be underscored today. But again, uh, Schein wasn't recommending this because he came out of um, Mars, but because he came out of America. Well, he has other recommendations in that regard, exploitation of opportunists and informers. He probably got that little one from the FBI. Convincing prisoners that they can trust no one. So the, the cultural paranoia, which I'm sure was um, at large on this campus and on every campus and among all of us that were trying to end the war, in the early 70s is now again made a tool, an exploitative tool against the prisoners. Convince them that they can trust no one. Well, maybe it's the ultimate definition of traditional hell. And the image, of course, it seems to me is powerfully present through all of this. It's almost a theological creation of a traditional uh, Dante universe. Hell is that place where we are convinced we can trust no one. And if that kind of spiritual change can be wrought upon the prisoners, they indeed are destroyed, as we know. Well, then the building of a group conviction among prisoners that they have been abandoned or are totally isolated from their social order. Um, so there, evidently the aim is not so much at blood ties or friendship, either within or without the prison, but it's isolation from citizenship, you see. It's placing one at the edge of economic and social responsibility where one can easily be toppled over and disappear. From another point of view, it occurred to me that it was the application of the prison scene of what some of the sociologists have called the the culture of poverty, you see. If you can put prisoners in a spiritual framework, a, a spiritual understanding on their own part, that they are really oh, unacceptable, out of the economy, without political voice, without professional future, um, then they, they, of course, join that huge circle of the alienated and the semi-destroyed who are very much a part of life today, especially in the, the great urban centers, but also in the countryside. Isolate them from their social order. That is to say, make them of no account in the life of the state. Well, that, that was a very old theme, too. Uh, we were even talking earlier tonight at supper about the old work, work ethic of the traditional prison. Uh, one of the methods of restoring the sin committed in public was to put one to work because uh, evidently there was a lot of the old biblical fundamentalism at work. And to be at work was to be rehabilitated or restored or to prove something. One had joined the whole kind of ideology of work as salvation. Uh, and of course, this was economically a very important part of keeping the sector undisturbed, the economic sector. I, I was uh, 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 
sharing tonight earlier some papers that we were able to get, some secret files we were able to get a hold of in Danbury Prison, um, in which the collusion between the top labor union leadership and the Bureau of Prisons was made evident. And especially in this regard, that no prisoner was to leave the federal system having improved his or her lot in the workforce. But the solid base of the unskilled laborers who came to prison was to remain solid <laughs> and large. And no one was to be advanced by way of the prison into the semi-skilled area. No one was to get ahead. So that the, uh, any number of these people coming out in another phase or another uh, kind of level of the workforce would disrupt what was already going on. That is to say, the, ne the wide necessity for semi-slave labor in the society itself. So in the prison, and, and with the common understanding of this tremendous ripoff of prison labor in the national workforce, um, the minority groups were to remain exactly that and return exactly as that, you see. The bottom of the economy, the, 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 the mass membership of that culture of poverty, which by now, of course, is a generational phenomenon. As we know, children are born into it, live in it, beget other children, and die in that culture. And we now have this kind of welfare culture, which is generational. And there are large numbers of our people who will be born and live and die outside the workforce or within that edgy, semi-slavish workforce which gets nowhere. Well, anyway, and this would go into other, other sectors of civic life as well. Um, I would think you have to, in, in this kind of scheme of things, you have to persuade people by all sorts of tactics that they are, practically speaking, of no value, that they are zeros. And at that point, they will, they will become, from any human point of view, sort of blind, deaf, and dumb, and uh, to be led or to be misled, but in any case, to be passive. And citizenship will be where it belongs, that is to say, in the hands of the elite and the engineers. <laughs> And the technicians, well, so that's a larger order of shine, and I think an even a superior insight to the one before. Well, it's hard to praise shine highly enough, but it certainly is a, a very powerful notion to propose that prisons be the way of reducing citizens to a human zero apart from any question of religion or of family ties, just looking upon them as civic integers, you see, or as potential numbers for the next war, um, as subjects of the vast sweep of the streets that is called the draft, you see, and so on. Well. And then there come more positive suggestions here, techniques of character invalidation. Well, I suppose that means stomping on people's necks. Humiliation, revolvement, shouting to induce feelings of fear, guilt, and suggestibility, coupled, coupled with sleeplessness. And exacting prison regimen and periodic interrogational interviews. So we're, we've learned a great deal from the Chinese and others in that regard. Well, that's somewhat, just a little bit of background of what actually is in force in the uh, Marian uh, prison and elsewhere. There are plans in several of the states now to reproduce this system uh, on the state level and elsewhere also on the federal level. Well, I wanted to get off that a little bit tonight. That, that was just a little bit of kind of psychohistory. Um, and just share with you a few convictions that have come up through friends and myself in the last couple of years of trying to deal with this Marian horror.
could I venture a general statement about the structures of a dying culture? It would go something like this, that at the top and largely throughout the middle authority of the structures, things tend to homogenize. That is to say, the same drives and methods are at work in the prison system as are at work in the State Department or the FBI or the court system or the Pentagon or dare one say the university. And that vast consortium of destruction that Eisenhower first pointed out as being kind of hyphenated horror of the military and the uh, economic now has to be enlarged. And we have other structures joining that kind of anti-human front. This is why at the very top, the leadership tends to water bug from the top of the FBI or the top of the university or the top of the State Department because there's a realization at that level that all the jobs are doing the same thing, roughly speaking. Well, that's, uh, I suppose, a statement that might, some might find outrageous and maybe we can spend some time on it later. More to our point tonight, or maybe to the point of my contribution, would be the following, that if that foregoing statement has some validity then what we learned in the 60s about nonviolent opposition holds true with regard to trying to do something about Marion or other like structural offenses. That is to say, they will only yield and then seldom and slowly and blindly, they will only yield before civil disobedience. This is not to say that one doesn't try everything else, as indeed we have. Whether to speak of the Vietnam War or of the anti-nuke movement or of the anti-Marian prison movement. But one does come to a point, many people do come to a point, where they realize the perennial truth of the old Gandhian saying, one is obliged to keep the law as long as one can, and then one is obliged to break the law. Well, with regard to the Marian prison, we're pretty much at that point. The committee in St. Louis has tried just about everything else. We, in conjunction with friends around the country, we have approached the authorities of practically every pro-human structure going from the churches to the Congress. Well, so uh, I, I think on November 27th, this was an extraordinarily important breakthrough when nine people occupied the office of the U.S. Bureau of Prisons in St. Louis and were dragged out. And now their fate is before the courts, if you see. And again, I, I, I want to point out a very important parallel. When we were dragged before the courts, our case which was in effect the case of the Vietnamese people and of our own poor soldiers was before the courts. We had a larger platform and the ante was up and the atmosphere was now heavily charged with the fate not of a few lost blacks and Hispanics, but in this case of many upstanding academic and religious people. So we have a very striking change of scene well, I wanted to introduce tonight one of these fine people, and uh, I would like him to uh, speak a little bit about that occasion and uh, perhaps introduce even a few of the others who took part. We have several of these wonderful people here. And I would, but, but I think we're really now at the nub of the evening as I would understand it. That is to say, we're trying to understand an entirely new phase in dealing with an inhuman public structure, which is adamantum against legal argument or redress. 
Well, Jim Dubert is a student here, as I understand. I only met him today. But we had a long, long opportunity to talk about these matters. And the proposal was made that the evening be shared with these people, because I think we are, we are beyond the point, as indeed we are at the Pentagon, when rational discourse alone, that bugbear and idol of the university, is going to suffice. And I think we have to understand that some kind of a new phase is in the air. Well, anyway, this is Jim Dubert, who was one of those who sat in in the grand tradition that we learn. And uh, I'd like if he would say a few words about all that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan. Um, Dan has offered to allow myself and uh, a few other people who are here tonight who are involved with the act of civil disobedience at the uh, at St. Louis in response to the uh, conditions at the Marion Control Unit to explain why we would make the step to uh, risk arrest and in fact be arrested and are now uh, risking six month terms in the uh, city jail in St. Louis for our action. It's a personal thing for each one of us and it's hard for I know all of us to explain exactly why we did. I think Dan gave some insights as to why civil disobedience is a tactic and a way that we have to respond to conditions that are morally evil. I know that uh, I'm a senior here at Iowa State. I've been here for several years. And I've been uh, more aware as time goes on that we have to take actions of all type to solve problems. And the university here has taught me that. It hasn't taught me always to do civil disobedience, but it's taught me to respond. I think that people in the Ames community are aware that we're told commonly to respond to issues of injustice. I think if you take that seriously, and I, like my brothers and sisters who also committed acts of civil disobedience in Marion, have taken it seriously in the case of Marion, that you have to respond in a way that you feel would be morally right for you to respond. Um, in the case of, of Marion, uh, like Father Baring had explained, we had made several requests to uh, resolve the issue through the courts and through the legislative uh, bodies and the people were unresponsive. The Bureau of Prisons has refused to answer letters from the prisoners uh, who have complained about the treatment at Marion Control Unit. So we made one last effort to contact the Federal Bureau of Prisons uh, official in St. Louis who is responsible for the unit. We sent him a letter. A group of us met in Eldora, Iowa in September, decided to send him a letter one last time pleading for him as a person in St. Louis who has control over the control unit to understand what the prisoners are going to and make steps to close the unit. We told him that we'd be down on the 27th of November, which was, I knew at that time was my quarter break, so I thought it'd be a nice way to spend my quarter break, go down and talk to a Federal Bureau of Prison person. And we also realized that, that we were gonna risk rest because we were to the point where we felt that we had to get some kind of a positive response from this official. And we asked him at the meeting, we explained all of our personal opinions to him at our meeting with him on the 27th. And he responded to us by saying that he would admit that there was a control unit, but that's as far as he could go. Our response was to him that we felt that he had to go farther. People were suffering and dying. So we asked him again up in his office to make some statement. Again, he refused. We asked him as a person you know, to make some statement positively, accepting the fact that you know, the conditions exist as they are and the people are dying, and to make you know, as a person. He again refused, saying that uh, he's with the Bureau of Prisons 24 hours of, a day, of the day. That really, you know, 
leaves leave, left up with, with very little choice as, as people who were trying to respond to this evil and as individuals were saying that we couldn't accept this evil. And because we couldn't accept this evil, we had no choice but to sit down in his office and tell him that you know, we don't have anything personally against him as a person, but against the evil system. We have to resist it, and we're going to stay here until that system makes some response to the needs of these uh, suffering brothers in the Marion Control Unit. I feel very much a part of, of the brothers in the unit. I don't know any of the brothers. I have very middle class back home, farm from Maquoketa, Iowa, and I'll never been in a prison very much except the last couple of years when I got arrested, but it wasn't a prison, it's just a city jail. I, I don't know any prisoners. My family's, you know, have always been farmers and none of them have ever got arrested for any acts of, of criminal uh, nature that I know. So uh, it isn't any, that, you know, I have a personal stake in, in the brothers there, but I do have a personal stake in the brothers there because they are uh, brothers to me and brothers to all of us here. And I had to respond to them and respond to their suffering in the way that I could. And the only way that I could was by to sit there with the other uh, brothers and sisters who sat there with me and tell the Bureau of Prisons person that we wouldn't leave until we had a positive response. And how, of course, he didn't change his mind, so arrest was the next imminent fact. And, we, and as I've said, we were, we were all arrested. Um, I don't know if you're going to understand, you know, all the reasons why we do these kind of things, but I just want you to try to understand that it is one way of responding, and I think it's an important way to respond in the type of society we have here today when the other alternatives of the court, the legal systems, uh, the legislative processes don't work. Um, I, I am not going to be able to tell you all the answers to why using civil disobedience and why to resist these evil structures. but. I just hope I can open, the, up to, up, open you up to the fact that people here in Ames, Iowa and around Iowa have made this step to do civil disobedience. I think that the rest of us here in this community should consider these, uh, these actions as viable ways of uh, social change and resisting evil. I want to introduce uh, some of the other folks who are here that were arrested with me. My brothers and sisters, there's a, uh, one sister and three brothers that are here and they may want to comment a little bit. And then I have a little request to make after they made some comments so you can help us in our efforts and civil disobedience and efforts to continue the, st the struggle to close the control unit. Uh, uh, Tim Dunn, if maybe people could come down here and then we'll have people talk. Steve Marston over there. Steve is, Tim is from St. Louis and with the committee. Steve's a close friend of mine. He's from Ames and presently living in Des Moines been around here for off and on for a few years. Uh, Jerry Blackman from Iowa City, a sister, and uh, Scott Myers from St. Louis. So I'll let any of them who want to say any few words uh, to speak up now. Um, mostly I'd like to thank you all for uh, having the courage to come here and listen, especially to Dan Berrigan. Uh, I remember when I was in college, it was listening to people who um, I think who developed my critical consciousness of, of America. Uh, I've been writing to the brothers for, oh, off and on for three years, and I was compelled, I think through writing and communicating with them, uh, compelled to put my body, um, I suppose, on the line and say no to the Bureau of Prisons. I just wanted to make one uh, particular point uh, in terms of why we committed uh, an act of civil disobedience at the U.S. Bureau of Prisons Office at Marion that um, I think would be enlightening uh, to all of you. Uh, I've been involved in the campaign to close the control unit for approximately three and a half years now. And when um, we first got involved, uh, let me be frank, we were really quite um, let us say, distraught and somewhat afraid of uh, even dealing with uh, the uh, men who were uh, in this particular control unit at Marion. Um, 
we were concerned uh, about uh, possible violence that might be involved in, in supporting them and uh, we're just afraid of the overall situation of even getting involved. All we really wanted to do was uh, try to uh, win a campaign through legal means in the courts, try to support class action suits that were being brought against the uh, control unit by the prisoners and really didn't want to have much of anything to do with the men in the control unit at all. Um, this began to change uh, the minute we did get involved. We started receiving uh, just voluminous amounts of mail uh, from the men in the control unit uh, almost from the very start and uh, began to carry on a correspondence with uh, many of these men. And uh, I think probably the most startling thing that, that happened uh, about a year and a half after we got involved was that uh, the committee that we had organized in St. Louis was broke and um, we had no money. Uh, we didn't even have any way of, um, of uh, even surviving ourselves in terms of personal survival, food, rent, and so on and so forth. And uh, I think it was in the uh, summer of um, 1977 the um, men in general population uh, in the prison took up a collection um, for uh, the committee and uh, in about um, the space of 24 hours raised somewhere between five and six hundred dollars uh, to uh, keep the committee going. And the men who uh, really went out and and took up this collection, I think there were probably three, four, or five of them, as a result of doing this, were put in the control unit um, for a month to two months period of time. So the upshot of all this is, is that the act of civil disobedience uh, for me and I think for the others was a, a real act of solidarity uh, and brotherhood with men in the uh, control unit. We have struggled together for a long time now. Uh, we have uh, been friends with men who have been released. There's a number of men who are out of the control unit now and we have been able to meet them and, and begin to work with them. And so a lot of our effort in uh, putting together this civil disobedience action was guided by our feelings of complete solidarity uh, with the men in the control unit. If they could uh, uh, get thrown in the control unit for raising money to try to keep our uh, group moving along, then we could certainly uh, take the slight effort of, um, of uh, holding a sit-in in St. Louis and risking minor kinds of charges like trespassing and peace disturbance uh, on their behalf. So I think that's the, uh, I just want to share that as an, an experience that we've had and a, a, a real important reason on why we uh, decided to commit civil disobedience and uh, go to jail uh, and be in the same type of circumstances that these men are in day after day, week after week, uh, year after year for uh, long periods of time. My name is Jerry Blackman and I'm from Iowa City and I just wanted to share with you the reason why I went down to St. Louis. I felt like I had a moral obligation to um, try and stop what was going on down there. I haven't ever been down there and I don't know anybody down there but um, through friends of mine I've heard a lot about Marion and I decided it was time that I went down and helped out. Um, the reason that I went in was because of the treatment, the inhumane treatment of the prisoners there. And I think that it's important that we try and stop it now because it can come outside the prisons into our jobs and into our children's lives. And I don't want to see that happen to our children. Thank you. Okay. I hope you uh, understand a little bit better as to why we at least we personally To 
why we personally made the, the step to do civil disobedience that we did. We're, we're asking now uh, for your help. Um, there is a local group here in, uh, in Ames, which is formed uh, last spring. And uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, a Roman Catholic, and faith was a very important part in my personal decision to make the act of civil disobedience. And other Christians and other people uh, who have similar views about justice and peace issues uh, last spring decided to join together in an effort to uh, work in this community to bring about a more just and peace, peaceful society. We set up what's called the Ames Peace Network, and we've grown surprisingly since last spring. And one project of the Ames uh, Peace Network is a task force on prison reform, of which uh, this Marion Control Unit is a very important part. The nine of us who were arrested are uh, up for the charges before the city uh, uh, magistrate in St. Louis. Uh, six months in uh, terms are the maximum we can get, so it isn't you know anything exorbitant. But we need lawyers' fees to uh, raise the issues that we try to present in our civil disobedience, to bring in some of the brothers from the unit to testify about the conditions there, to bring in experts around the country to talk about what the uh, psychological effects that Dan was talking about are, and what effect they have on, on society and the, and the brothers that are in there. And that costs money for the lawyers and for the charges. And so we're going to ask, and we have special permission to do this from the university, ask you to, to support us if you can. Support our Ains Peace Network and support uh, the, the nine of us, of which six of us are from Iowa, so it's not you know, like you're supporting a lot of people from way off East Coast or West Coast. We're Iowa people. We're close to you. And this is, uh, you're, part, you're part of the, the, pro the system too. And I'm just asking you to, to join in in this little way with some financial contributions to support us in our efforts to close the unit, to uh, be able to uh, use the court system as a way of helping to uh, solve the problems of the brothers. So as you leave, there are going to be some folks that are going to be at the doors with some buckets. And if you could donate a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, whatever, four dollars, ten dollars, whatever you feel, <laughs> whatever you feel uh, is necessary. And the money will be divided among the Ames Peace Network and the Iowa Peace Network and the, uh, the defense fund for the uh, folks who are on trial for the act of civil disobedience. And I really, again, just ask you to contribute. Yeah, Tom? Right, Dan is making a, a sacrifice, speaking around the country to help the brothers, and that's greatly appreciated. And, um, we all have to make whatever efforts we can. I know if you don't have any money, you don't, you want to get in, do some more. There's also an effort, or a, an opportunity to get involved here locally, like I said, with the Ains Peace Network, and we're having a meeting tomorrow at noon in the Collegiate Methodist Church, in what's called the Cube in the Collegiate Methodist Church, about an hour or so meeting. We're going to be discussing task force, of which one of them is this task force on, on prisons. So I'd encourage anybody who wanted to participate here locally in, a, in efforts to uh, help the brothers and also other efforts in, in peace and social justice to attend the meeting tomorrow at noon in the Collegiate Methodist Church. So uh, I'll let Dan take back over again and finish, and he'll give you some time for some, some questions, too. Thanks for your time and listening with us. Well, thanks to the uh, St. Louis Nine. <clears throat> Maybe there are some questions from the audience. I'd be very happy to share my ignorance in almost any field. <laughs> 